All right, hi, welcome to another session of Sunday Talks within the Nine-Sided Circle. It is December 15th on the Pacific Coast of the United States. And tonight we're gonna to be talking about, well, we're gonna be talking about fools and Harlequin clown type figures within the work. And uh, Mishtap will be able to elaborate on that more, but in the meantime, I am your host, Noor Kyle, along with your other host. That would be me, Mushtaq Ali. So, with no further ado, introduce us, Mushtaq. All right, so first, before I say anything, let me invite you to, if you are listening to this on YouTube, to look down to your right and see that little subscribe button and hit it. And also ding that bell so that you get notified every time we put something up. Because who would want to miss this? Mm. Okay, so I'm going to start tonight with a story. And the story has to do with the, 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 what's going on behind me. Y'all see that? See a little of this. See a little of this. So this is Taos Pueblo in northern New Mexico. And many, many, one of my uncles is from Taos. Uh, he was born, you can't see his house from here, but uh, it's just on the other side of those houses on uh, over here. And uh, back around 1979 or 78, I was traveling with him through the Southwest and he got a call. Uh, we were staying at uh, one of his grandmother's houses uh, in Albuquerque, and he got a call, and it was from the governor of San Domingo Pueblo, which is another one of the Rio Grande Pueblos, inviting him to be his guest at the Pueblo feast day. Now, the feast days at the Pueblos are usually set up to coincide with a major ceremony. There she is. And... Uh, at Santa Domingo, it is the corn dance, which happens uh, in summer, towards the end of summer. And uh, it's both a Catholic feast day and a traditional native ceremony. Uh, over in one corner of the, uh, the big plaza, you have uh, the Catholic saint statue sitting under a little arbor. He's watching over everything. But What's going on is that every clan is dancing all day long uh, and they dance in pairs. And the, the ceremony has to do with bringing the rain. And uh, so the, the men and women are in these elaborate regalia. The, the women have these big tablitas on their heads and very, very fancy clothing and they have uh, uh, spruce branches in their hands. Uh, the men uh, have gourds that they're shaking and uh, skunk skins wrapped around their feet and fox skins hanging from the back of their belt and very, very elaborate costumes. And it goes uh, in a procession, man, woman, man, woman, starting with the oldest members and ending with the youngest. So you will see maybe six-year-old kids out there dancing at the, the tail end of the line. Now, the important thing is that in order for the ceremony to work, it has to be done perfectly. There can be no mistakes. And you can imagine how hard that is with a uh, couple hundred people dancing clan by clan all day long to the uh, songs, uh, traditional songs with drummers and singers. And uh, so here we are, We're, we, we have wandered through the Pueblo. The thing about feast day, uh, which is very, very good, is that if you see an open door, you can walk into that house and they will feed you. And they will feed you really good food guaranteed that like the best they can put out and it is 
incredibly delicious and very, very nice. So my uncle and I, his name was Richard, by the way. Um, he's, I'm actually his namesake, or he's my namesake, whichever direction that goes in. One of us is the namesake of the other. Um, and uh, so we get to the plaza as the dancers are starting up. So they're all lined up and the priest over in the corner does whatever he does with the blessing and stuff. And then they all start dancing. And so you have all of these dancers who are very, very serious. And then you have the clowns. Now, if you can imagine, the clowns are painted with uh, charcoal and ash. So black and white stripes, their hairs are done up in horns. They're you know, got these big old fat smiling faces painted on them, and they're dancing backwards. They're goofing around. They're making obscene gestures to every woman they see. Uh, they are doing all of the stupid stuff. And so I'm watching, I'm watching the dancers and I'm watching the clowns, and I, I see this little girl who is getting very, very tired because it's probably 95 degrees out, and she's like stumbling a little bit. And before you know it, there's this clown who just comes up behind her, lifts her up and puts her on his shoulders and dances her around for a good five minutes while she's catching her breath. And then picks her off and, and puts her back down in, in the line. And then another clown, there's a, a man whose fox skin is coming loose and the, and the clown just kind of comes up and tucks it back in. Um, and this goes on all day. Anytime something is going wrong, the clowns are, are, have stopped clowning and or they find a way to clown in such a way that they fix the thing that has gone wrong. And at the end of it, my uncle says to me, uh, what did you learn? And I said, I learned that the clowns are doing something interesting, but I, I cannot understand what it is that they're doing and why it's okay. And he said, clowns operate outside the rules for the purpose of making sure that the rules work. Because no human being can ever do anything perfectly. And without the, the sacred clown, uh, we would be lost because they can, they can fix our imperfection through their clowning. So that's the story I want to give you as an introduction to tonight's talk. Any questions on that before I go on? It sounds like real clowns in that sense are pretty rare. Um, yeah, those kinds of clowns, you don't just decide to be a clown. You, the way you become a, a clown in most of the Pueblos, I can't speak to all of them, just the, the ones that I know about, is that you get really, really sick, usually with a stomach ailment. Um, and the clowns, the, the clown society cures you because they're healers. And if they cure you, you have to join their society. But you get superpowers. The clowns can eat anything, and they will oftentimes demonstrate that by eating disgusting things and not getting sick. You know, they, they will have uh, roadkill soup. Uh, and they get to operate outside the rules of society. But that's it. In most of the Pueblos, that's how you become a clown. And in other tribes, uh, there are different ways, and there are all sorts of different kinds of clowns. Everybody's heard of the Hayoka, right? No. No, Hayoka is a Plains Indian uh, kind of sacred clown figure. Uh, they are the, the backwards men. And they are usually touched by the thunder spirit, the thunderbird, they say. And they will do everything backwards. They'll ride their horse backwards. When they say yes, they mean no. When it's hot, they will wrap themselves up in blanket. When it's snowing, they will be out there in nothing but a loincloth. Uh, and they are considered to be very, very powerful healers and seers. So that's a, another version of, of the sacred clown. But it's a tradition that you find throughout um, all of America. Uh, you have Coyote, of course, who is the ultimate clown trickster. 
in a lot of American, uh, Native American tales. You have uh, the raven in the Pacific Northwest and, and other parts. Um, I can mostly speak to the Southwest, but um, yeah, the, the Apaches have uh, not just coyote as a, as a clown figure, but they have an actual clown that comes with the mountain spirit dancers. Uh, you'll see these four big guys dancing about and one little tiny dude uh, clowning around behind them, making fun of them behind their backs and all of this kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a tradition here, but it's a tradition in a lot of places. And we all are familiar with the tales of Mullah Nasruddin, right? Mm -hmm. He is a classic example of uh, the sacred clown in Islamic literature. And there are, there are several, uh, but he's the most famous. You also have uh, the, 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 the idea of the sacred clown uh, easing up into uh, Europe through Spain and Italy. And uh, you all know how, how Sufis tend to wear patched cloaks. You know about mm -hmm. that tradition? Yes, no, maybe. Mm. Okay, so. Um, the patch cloak, according to uh, many, many traditions, is where the Harlequin gets his diamond pattern clothing. And the Harlequin, uh, which you find in, uh, for instance, uh, Commedia dell'arte, um, is a, uh, a trickster figure. He's... Uh, agile and uh, acrobatic and weird and fun. Uh, and often teaches through his antics. So why do you think that this would be a thing? What is the purpose of the trickster within uh, any form of the work? What are your thoughts, Sina? Making it less serious? Yes, definitely, but why? Let me ask you a question. Who is the one person who can tell the king that he's an idiot? <laughs> the clown. Exactly. The fool, the clown, the jester, the harlequin, the guy in the patched and, and motley clothing. He can get away with saying things that nobody else can. And oh, we have a message from Nancy. And yep, Nancy says they're about mental and emotional flexibility. So then she asks, So why can't you have a society made of clowns? We would run out of cream pies. <laughs> Yeah, that would be it. Not enough cream pies to go around. There would be a shortage. <laughs> Not to mention everybody would try to get in the car at once. <laughs> so. I would think it's because it's easier to get around people's 
presuppositions and beliefs when you can play games with their ideas and point them out as silly by using humor. Yep. <laughs> yep. You can oftentimes say things to people in quotes that you can't say directly. Mm -hmm. You understand what I mean? Say more about that. <clears throat> you know, Kyle, I was talking with Zainab the other day, mm -hmm. and she said that you are a very, very silly person. And I said, no, she can't be a silly person. And Zainab said, yeah, she's, she's incredibly silly. Uh, I would not be surprised if at night, late at night, when nobody's looking, she gets out a clown nose and puts it on her face and jumps around the house. That's what Zainab said. I don't believe it, but she said that. <laughs> she didn't really say that, of course. You're right. Yes, but that's how you can say things in, in quotes and get away with it, which mm -hmm. is kind of what the, uh, the jester does. It, with his stories he can he can tell you a story about anything and have it stick on you the other thing about clowns jesters and uh <coughs> such things how many people here can remember a nasiridian story show of hands any nasiridian story Omar has his hand up. Good. Yeah, so how many people can quote to me uh, from a sacred text? No hands go up. Yeah, we had more last time. Yep. So there is the other thing. You will remember a joke or a funny story a lot longer than you will remember anything else. So the clown, the trickster, the sacred fool hides the truth in the jokes. It's the same thing with the Zen guys. You know, the Zen guy's got a good deal going because all of the Zen teachers are clowns. Right? Student comes to Muhmin and says, does a dog have Buddha nature? And Muhmin takes off his shoes, puts them on his head and walks out of the room. You gotta love a, a, a religion that can get away with doing that. And you know that that student was thinking about what the heck did that mean for days afterwards. So how does one become a clown? How does one become the sacred fool? Any thoughts, any guesses? Dave, what do you think? I think the job chooses you. To a certain extent, but what is the process by which you express that job? Dave may not be the person to ask because he's, he's all serious and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by process? How, what is the difference between a mundane clown and a sacred clown. How, what is the difference in their expression? How do they get to where they are? You know, the mundane clown, the guy that you see in the circus, you know, he's got an act, he's got a routine that he does. 
The sacred clown has no act, no routine. So how does he find his material? Well, <clears throat> I would say it presents itself in the occurrences. It's a more spontaneous expression. And the clown, the sacred one, would have to know how to utilize the situation at hand to teach something. So there's that. So. And I would suppose that, you know, they have to be at least aware of the oddnesses of the weirdnesses in the surroundings, you know, so you can spot it and react to that, you know, or at least, you know, play off those things. Yep. And in a very specific way, you have this rule here. Here's a rule. You have this rule here, and then you have what's between those two rules. Mm -hmm. The clown is always looking between things. And this is very much like the void practice, interestingly mm -hmm. enough. Little do you know, but I've been turning you all into clowns this whole time. <laughs> You know, according to the old, in the ancient Celtic tr traditions, the in-between is where the magic happens. You know that? Yeah, I remember us having a conversation about that. Yeah. We talked about the, uh, the old folk song, Scarborough Fair. Mm -hmm. Anybody remember the lyrics to Scarborough Fair? I can look them up real quick to help out. And don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to sing it. <laughs> Scarborough Fair is a song that is based on magical practice, on the old, old magic of, of the Isles. And you'll notice that in uh, the descriptions of everything around them. Like uh, between the salt water and the sea strand. What is between the salt water and the sea strand? All right, I'm going to cut and paste into the comments. to sew a shirt without no thread nor needlework. And on and on, all of these in-between things. And this is, uh, this is kind of, if there is a universal theme within sacred clowning around the world that I've seen, it's this. It's that the clown, the, the trickster, the fool operates in this in-between state that is neither this nor that. And that's why he or she can see differences uh, that other people can't. So is your sacred clown necessarily, no, okay, uh, is, is, is he or she just aware of the two polarities or, the two, or is he also, or she also somehow in touch with some reconciling force between them? I would say the, the, the clown is the, the force that reconciles. Mm. So yeah, it's exactly that. Okay. So just being aware of the of the tension isn't sufficient. The clown has to bring also the reconciliation in the way, right? Yeah. Okay. And that's why they can get away with in uh, the on the feast day, making sure that everything works correctly, mm -hmm. because they get to move in between the rules. Mm -hmm. They aren't breaking the rules so much as they are operating. Um, at a right angle to the rules. But with the intent of making the rules work, 
No, yeah. they're not anarchists, right? They're not yeah. there to destroy the, the rules, but rather to make them work. Is that what yes. you're saying? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. If it weren't for the clowns, a lot of things would not work. Mm. When we say not work, what do we mean? Uh, the ceremony would fail because the people would not have been able to do it correctly. Mm. The perfection needed for the ceremony would have broken down. You know, the little girl would get tired. The little boy mm -hmm. would get distracted. Um, and the one thing that can't happen is you can't have a six-year-old girl sit down in the middle of the plaza while everybody's dancing and start crying because she's uh, upset because it's hot and she's tired and her feet hurt. Mm -hmm. But if you happen to have a clown handy, he can fix all that. That's nothing for him. He can move her outside of the rules with him and give her a chance to get her composure back. And then just put her right back in. So how does a sacred crown differ from an engineer who also fixes things, right? Who, uh, you know... The engineer always follows the rules. The engineer has to follow the rules or the thing that he's working on will fall apart. Uh, you know, my local handyman seems to <laughs> be able to... Is your local handyman an engineer? Does he have a degree in engineering? No, he doesn't, you know. Yeah, so... But basically fixing stuff by essentially almost sensing what needs to be done, you know. Yeah, see, that's not an engineer. Right. So, but, so is that a sacred clown? I don't know your handyman, so I couldn't okay. say. Right. Does he make you laugh while he's doing it? <laughs> Sometimes, yes. But... <laughs> well, then you never know. Does he have green eyes? No. <laughs> not that I've noticed, no. Which actually, is the green man some version of the... Clown? Yes, the green man and Hitter, uh, the hidden the hidden teacher, is also a version of the, the trickster figure. Mm. You know the story of, of Moses and Hitter? Know. Everybody knows that story. Yeah. You can refresh everyone's memory. Only. Let me refresh your memory. So, this is an old story. It's not in the Torah, but it is in the Judaic tradition that found its way over to, uh, to Arabia and such things. Uh, so Moses, when he was wandering in the wilderness after he split from Egypt, after killing that overseer, um, you know, he was, yeah, this was before the burning bush days, or was this, happen? yeah, this was before the burning bush days. Uh, he's out tending sheep, and he sees Hitter, and he immediately recognizes him for who he is because Moses is a prophet and all of that. So he has sight and discernment. And he runs up to him and he grabs his, the hem of his cloak and he says, uh, please teach me. And Hitter says, I can't teach you. You could not follow my teachings. And Moses says, yes, I can. I can do it. I am, I am a very, very good student. And Hitter says, no, no, you can't. And Moses says, yeah, please, 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 pretty please, pretty please with mutton on it. And Hitter says, all right, here's the deal. I will teach you, but you are not allowed to answer any, ask any questions about what I'm doing until I myself explain it to you. And Moses says, sure, I can do that. I'd be happy to do that. And so they go off together and they come up to uh, the house of a woman and her children. And it's obvious that there are no men around. And Hitter goes up to the wall around the house because they had walls around the house back then because you never knew who was going to try and get in. But Hitter goes up to the wall and he kicks it and he knocks it over and leaves this big gap in the wall. And Moses looks at him and goes, why did you do that? Why did you hurt these people? And Hitter says, I told you, you can't ask me questions. And Moses says, oh, you're right. I'm sorry. I don't understand. I don't know why you did this. It seems like a cruel thing, but I will not ask. And Hitter says, all right, I, I, I forgive you. Come along. 
and they go along and they get to the to a river and they see an old man with a boat and they ask the old man if they can borrow the boat to row across the river and the old man says sure they row across the river they get out of the boat Peter goes up and he kicks a hole in the bottom of the boat and the boat sinks and Moses looks at him and says why in the world did you do that? That man was kind to us. He was nice to us. He lent us the boat. And you repay him by destroying it for him. I don't get this. How, how is that the, the act of a spiritual being? And Khidr says, I told you, you cannot question me. And Moses apologizes again and Khidr forgives him again. And they go off down the road. A little bit later on, there is a group of people coming and it's a family and father, son, mother, daughters, aunts, uncles, and they're all surrounded this boy. This boy is like lovely. He's beautiful. He's, you know, dark ringlets of hair and big almond eyes and all of this. And they obviously are all doting upon him. And Hitter comes up and with one blow, he kills the boy. He strikes him down. And everybody is terrified and they all run off because, I mean, it's kind of scary. And Moses said, okay, that's, that's beyond the pale here. You just killed this, this innocent kid. I don't get your teachings. And Hitter says to Moses, Moses, okay, that's it. You can no longer be my student, but out of kindness to you, I'm going to explain to you the things that you couldn't see that uh, would have made you just shut up and pay attention had you known them. First, that house, it belonged to a, a, a widow. Her husband had died a few weeks before. They're destitute, they're impoverished, and they didn't know where the, uh, the husband had left their wealth. He'd left it in that wall. And as they're rebuilding the wall right now, they're going to discover it. That boat that you were so worried about, had I not punched a hole in the bottom of it, the bandits that were coming down off of the hills that you didn't see would have taken that boat, rowed it across the river, and robbed and killed the old man. And as for this boy, had he grown up, he would have been one of the greatest tyrants that the world has ever seen. And so, because you cannot see these things, even though they're ev evident to me, you've got to go away. And so Moses did. And it took a long time before he got to full-blown prophethood when he was doing weird stuff. But that's an example of uh, a trickster figure doing things that make no sense, that make everything work. I feel like I, I need a clown horn to go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, people find those stories pretty perturbing because they go against the rules of what we consider ethical. Mm -hmm. And certainly we would not encourage people to necessarily go do those things because we don't necessarily have the understanding that a figure like a hitter might have. Um, but nonetheless, it's a good illustration of the way that clowning can go beyond the surface of things. It can dig into the deeper significances of the circumstance. So is there any test for differentiating? What's that? Official clowns from essentially people who are pretending to be beneficial clowns and actually killing people for just for the hell of it? Probably. And what would that be? I don't know. I've never run across one. Which type? Uh, the the ones who are just killing the one killing you for the hell of it. Mm. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll send you an invitation to Trump's dinner and I'll take it from there. <laughs> yeah, there are no sacred clowns in, in Trump's camp. Mm -hmm. Sorry. 
Uh, see, there's just one of these mass shooters who is a sacred clown, but which one? You know, that is not looking between the things. Mm. Would a sacred clown be a mass shooter? Probably not. A sacred clown might put down a banana peel so some evil person would slip on it and fall and break their neck. Where do we find the sacred clown in today's mythology? I know what one of your favorites is. Yeah? yeah. Which one? Bugs Bunny. Yep. yep. Bugs Bunny is a modern archetype of the sacred clown. I'm trying to think of any others. Does anyone else have any... Uh... Anything that comes to mind? Think of George Carlin. Oh, yeah. He came pretty close to that job. Mm. Mel Brooks. Mel Brooks, for damn sure. <laughs> Mel Brooks could make a movie about Nazis and get away with it. Think about that. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go watch the producers. But is there anybody who's working now? And that's a good question. I'm thinking about it and I'm not sure right now. I mean, that may be something that has yet to emerge. I'm sure people are doing it now. It's just, we may not recognize them yet. Yeah, probably um, somebody who might approximate it a little bit would be Russell Brand. Hmm. Interesting. And the, there, these are of course degrees here. Oh, yeah. You know, Hitter is, you know, he's maybe an archangel. He's maybe, you know, an enlightened being, an immortal master, all of that kind of stuff. So he gets away with doing things like murdering kids who are going to grow up to be tyrants. I just wonder where the hell he was when Trump was 10. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> say that. You did not hear that. <laughs> Uh, that did not happen. These are not the droids you're looking for. But uh, George Carlin made you see things through jokes, through his humor. Robin Williams did the same thing. Mm -hmm. You go to laugh and you come away thinking. I guess I'm still concerned about how how you identify one of these characters, right? Why do you uh, think that you would get to identify one of them? Well, because it seems to me it's easy. Well, I don't know, maybe not easy, but it's possible to mislead people by pretending to be essentially, um, you know, a clown of this type. I mean, in the Zen tradition, for example, there's, you know, there, there's certain people who essentially misuse that, or do damage, basically, by saying, well, we're just doing it, uh, it we're just tricksters, basically, you know. Uh, yeah. and it seems well, here's, to be here's, a, here's a hint. If somebody says, oh, I'm just a trickster, they're not. Mm. There, there is a, I mean, what did Jesus say about this? I haven't talked to him recently. What did he say? 
He said, by their fruits you will know them. Where do they point? Where do they take your attention? Do they put your attention on them? Or do they put your, their, your attention on the divine reality? What is their message? What is the outcome of their actions? So with Hitter, you would go back to the woman whose wall was kicked down. And you'd say, hey, how are you doing? And she said, the weirdest thing happened. Some dude came by and kicked down my wall. And I was putting it up with my kids and we found this hole. And in the hole was my husband's secret stash of wealth. Isn't that a curious thing? You go to the old man and uh, you say, how's life? And he says, well, you know, it's the funniest thing. Um, my boat got broken across the, the, the river there and I thought, oh my God, this is a disaster for me. But then these bandits rode up and they couldn't get across the river because it was too deep and too fast. And all they could do was sit on the other side of the river and shake their fists at me. And so I sat there and I mooned them for an hour. So what is the outcome? What are the actions uh, that come from the person? With the kid, you couldn't tell. With the kid, you couldn't tell, no. But you could tell with the other two. And remember, we're talking, you know, high level prophethood here. Which means what? In other words, I mean, I, I think the question is legitimate. I mean, yes, you look at the results, but then again, you know, you'll get your results in the promised land after you die, right? I mean, uh, how, how are you going to check that? Story. <laughs> I mean, we're talking archetypes. Yeah, we're talking story, story here. Yeah. We're talking something that happened 6,000 years ago. Times were different then. Angels walked among us. It doesn't happen now. And you can focus on that and ignore everything else, in which case you'll definitely miss the point of this. Or you can pay attention to the parts that you can think about. Like, oh yes, you can say things and do things in, in a way that will make th people think. If you're George Carlin, you can get up there and you can say some pretty outrageous stuff and totally get away with it. I don't think Carlin even ever got arrested for his act. So, do you think you're a sacred clown? If you do, you're not. Do you think you hear the voice of God? If you do, you don't. If you are guided to say something funny in a certain way, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's not a job you apply for. No kosher in any Pueblo wanted to be a sacred clown. They got drafted because it was a choice of that or die. I'd have thought that non-binary awareness means you have some sense that you're doing the thing that's called for, even if you don't call it sacred clowning. Yeah, it, that seems like that's the case. And my point is uh, with, with the hitter story, you know, that's above the pay grade of most sacred clowns. You know, when you're an immortal master, you can do these things. And I happen to know that there are no immortal masters running around in the Bay Area right now. So more thoughts. Do sacred clowns spend a 
I don't know, period early in their lives where they're trying to be a normal person? Um, that's a good question. I think some of them do. Which ones did you have in mind, Nancy? Um, I was just trying to imagine what the life trajectory might be. You know, I'm, I'm guessing here. Um, your typical class clown or person to grow, who grows up to be a comedian, a lot of them seem to have been living in dysfunctional families and schools with bullies, and they find that they can make themselves safe by getting people to laugh. I don't know. We lost you now. Oh, hello? Oh, okay. Hi. Sorry, we just lost the end of your, your thought about oh. you were discussing um, the upbringings of a lot of comedians. Sometimes right. often contains, you know, a lot of hardship. And in particular, hardship where they find that they can diffuse other people's anger or abusiveness by being funny. Mm. And I don't know if this is part of the path of the sacred clown or not. It might be. I mean, uh, within the Pueblos, like I said, the path of the sacred clown usually involves getting really, really sick, sick unto death kind of sick. Mm -hmm. And being cured and the deal for being cured is that you have to join the group. Mm -hmm. So uh, why it would be that the, only the clowns could cure that person? I don't know. The clowns would know. I mean, this suggests that these people would rather have been a normal member of society. Yeah, oftentimes I suspect that that's the case. Yeah, do you think that uh, Robin Williams would n not have rather been normal? He was having a bad time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yet he was one of the most brilliantly humorous people I've ever run across. So, Ilmar does have a very important point, though, of the, the, the question of what about these people who claim to be trickster teachers? And my answer to that is that uh, tricksters are not teachers in that sense. Tricksters don't take on students. You do so not get. What, so, what is their function? To essentially restore an order kind of behind the scenes? Yeah, pretty much. Mm. Yeah, to uh, oftentimes to diff diffuse situations. Mm. Um, let me give you an example. You've, you've seen The Jewel of the Nile, right? Yeah. You remember the scene where uh, they're in the Nubian village and uh, the guy is getting his ass kicked by the big Nubian wrestler and uh, Al Johara starts clowning around and, you know, swallowing his umbrella and balancing stuff and distracting everybody. Do you remember that scene? Vaguely. I, I had to see that one yeah, again. You may have to go back and watch that movie again because one of the aspects of it that I found uh, beyond perfect was the depiction of Al Johara as a, uh, a Mullah Nasruddin figure, somebody who used uh, humor and clowning to teach, as did most of his uh, disciples. They were not the sacred fool in uh, the sense that we've been talking about it, but you know, jugglers, magicians, entertainers, uh, and above all else, uh, diffusing a situation by being a joker. 
One of the things that within the Sufi tradition, in order to be the sacred clown, you have to have no ego because you are your own best material. But I guess then that still raises a question for me at least. You know, it seems, uh, well, take your Pueblo uh, uh, sacred clown. <clears throat> You're saying they become one by going through one of these uh, life-threatening uh, illnesses. Okay? Yeah. But it seems to me that in a sense, that's the external occasion for it. So at some place along the line, it seems to me, the person who's gonna have that role has to have an ability to see what's between the two extremes. To yep. see it's, pos it's possible that the uh, healing ceremony that they put the guy through gives him that or shows him that he has that. It's possible. And that seems to me to be the crucial critical thing to look at. I mean, I'd love to hear about that. Yeah, but see, that's, that's outside my pay grade. Ah. Okay. Yeah, the only people who know are the people who have been through it. Mm -hmm. And it seems like something is necessary. Something like that is must must happen. Is necessary, right? Otherwise, I mean, yeah, there there is something that happens that changes them in a very fundamental way. Yeah. They are not the same person coming out that they were going in. Yeah, yeah. And I can't tell you what it is because, frankly, it's none of my business. Mm -hmm. It's not like, uh, it's, it's not something that I have any right to know. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the traditional Anglo thing to do of sticking your nose in where it don't belong is not something that the Pueblos really welcome. Mm. Yeah, you can't see it here, but you see that uh, barrier right there over my shoulder, over this shoulder? I think so. Yeah, there's a little sign there. It basically says you are not allowed to go beyond this point. There was a sacred thing and that thing with the, the wood and the two long poles sticking up. Oh, that's yeah, one yeah. of the kivas. Hmm. And it's sacred and nobody gets to go there who doesn't belong there. And if you were to be, you know, your standard crass white person and go walking over there, the Pueblo police would show up and haul your ass out to the gate of the Pueblo and give you a good boot. because you got to know what's your business and what isn't your business. I know, I know the clowns from the outside. I definitely do not know them from the inside. Um, and I never will. And I'm fine with that because eating garbage is not something that I'm really want to do. Uh, and they will do. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they'll drink poison uh, and be fine afterwards. It's kind of weird, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, like I said, that's outside my pay grade. Mm -hmm. And I'd rather be Mullah Nasruddin because I like donkeys. <laughs> Especially rainbow donkeys. <laughs> So you see yourself more as a teacher, presumably, whereas the sacred clowns is more of a fixer, almost like you know, he's he or she's fixing stuff which is not working and doing that kind of behind the scenes. And those seem like those are two very distinct paths and very distinct. They, they are. Yeah, yeah, I am. I am not a sacred clown. I am not a trickster. Mm -hmm. I am not any of these things. Uh, nor would I want to be. And if you caught me doing something stupid or wrong and using the excuse of, oh, I'm doing this as a lesson to these people, I would be one, full of shit, and two, somebody you should have nothing to do with. Mm -hmm. This whole, I am a, I am a Hayoka teacher, that first of all, you're using the word wrong. Second of all, you ain't, you ain't Lakota. Third of all, no, you're not. You're just a con man. 
which is to not which is not to say that there aren't teachers who are, are are a little bit tricksy rascal gurus as we like to call them but you, you don't find them that often um gurjeef was one such and uh, the last guy who i actually knew was a fellow by the name of lee lozowick who died um a few years ago mr lee they called him he was absolutely uh, a trickster in his own right and a great teacher as well. But, you know, as far as I never heard him making excuses for doing something bad because he was trying to teach somebody a lesson. And Fanny has a question. You mentioned Bugs Bunny before. Would you find these characters often in kids' movies? Of these funny characters, there are maybe are maybe not tricksters. Um, I don't see them as often as I used to. Bugs Bunny was a total uh, trickster archetype, uh, and uh, you also have Coyote and Roadrunner, where the Roadrunner is the trickster and the Coyote is the fool. But you don't see that so much. Uh, the quality of cartoons has uh, gone downhill. There, there are not enough cartoonists who are taking large amounts of psychedelics anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I've been exposed to lots of different contemporary cartoons, and I'm struggling to think of any examples myself. Yep. They've, they've kind of gotten watered down. The closest that we came to was a few years ago when uh, Warner Brothers tried to get back to the old style with uh, the Animaniacs. Oh, that's, yes. I feel like that's a good example. Yeah, that came, that came closer to it than anything that I, else I've seen in a while. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, you don't hardly see that anymore, which is too bad. I learned a lot from Bugs Bunny. Who did you? I did. I learned that you can defeat evil by being trickier and funnier and goofier than evil is because evil has no sense of humor. That's another aspect of sacred clowns. Evil doesn't have a sense of humor. Evil doesn't laugh. Not in, not in, in true mirth and merriment. Yeah. Because it's not about the sadism. It's not that. It's, no. It's... And this is why, you know, for instance, Nazis can't stand to be laughed at. Some of the most effective protest stuff I've ever seen has been not getting out there and angrily yelling at people, but like, uh, God, who was it? The Westboro Baptist Church was out mm -hmm. doing the stuff that it did and uh, a group of dancers who were uh, performing at this theater that they uh, they were protesting came out and all of them led the entire cr crowd in doing the time warp. <laughs> and they did it so well that the Westboro Baptist Church packed up and left. Because evil can't stand being laughed at. That's actually kind of interesting because, uh, you know, one sort of theory in a sense about humor is that it's basically a way of reconciling attention, 
of, if, um, I, I forget the name of the novelist uh, who wrote the book on it, basically, but, um, you know, but he was trying to understand what, you know, what are the characteristics of, of a joke, basically, of humor. And I was saying that basically it builds up tension and reconciles it somehow. Uh, and it ideally reconciles in a, in a way that was unexpected. Unexpected, exactly, yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, um, who was it? Uh, he was a novelist also, but uh, uh, wrote, um, he was, uh, I think, a, he was in a Bolshevik prison for a while. What the hell is his name? I'm blanking his name at the moment. But uh, yeah. anyway, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking of one of the great comedians of the, the, the 40s and 50s who said, okay, you want to understand humor? So you have a poem, roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. You listen to that. But then I would say, roses are red, violets are blue. You think that this is going to rhyme, but it ain't gonna. <laughs> and there's where the humor is. And in that case, what, what's the polarity that gets reconciled there? Or is there one there? There is one, but it gets reconciled inside of you. Mm, okay, because you, you, okay. yeah, you have to take it in and, and reconcile it within yourself. Mm, okay. And so is it possibly that that's the, one of the mechanisms, at least, that the, your sacred clown is using? It's essentially showing a way of, I guess, psychically reconciling tensions like that? I mean, yeah. aside from ones that are actually fixing a, you know, a little girl that's, that's tired, you know? But, you know. I mean, I'm assuming that you're bringing up this, this sacred clown thing as, as a as something uh, as a useful function or, yeah there is method to my madness yes i'm trying to get to that method here. <laughs> well it's not something that you're going to be able to think logically about mm -hmm. the thing about the sacred clown is that they require you to make a leap of intuition And that intuition must allow you to reconcile the tension between yes and no, the tension between black and white. Fanny has to head out, so I will say good night to her. We're good night, Fanny, or good morning. Have a good afternoon. Good morning over there. Take care. Yeah, and we're going to have to wrap this up pretty quick, too, because it's late for everybody, except for me. By the way, the guy I was thinking was Arthur Kressler. He's the guy that wrote that uh, really interesting book on humor. Mm. Yeah. All right. Dave has to take off, too. See yep. you, Dave. Oh, he peaced out. Cool. Yep. So that's basically what I got for you tonight on The Sacred Clown. on the Harlequin, on the trickster, the idea that you can speak truth to power if power thinks that you're insane. <laughs> or you can speak truth to power as long as you're wearing a big red nose. Mm -hmm. Or rabbit ears. Or rabbit ears. Or giant turban. Yep. <laughs> uh, does anybody know of Pickles the Clown? Why does that sound familiar to me? That sounds familiar, but I can't uh, can't Tell place it off more. In my head. Uh, he he's on YouTube. He he is a rather good singer, but oh, he puddles. Puddle, puddles 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 okay. puddles the sad clown with the golden voice. 
Yeah, and yeah. the grim expression, and he's doing something. Yeah, he's. Uh, I find him brilliant. I don't think he's quite at the level of sacred clown at this point, but he does sing amazingly well. Mm -hmm. Yep, I've been a fan of Puddle since the first time I ran across him with that uh, Lord song that he did better than she did. <laughs> Yep, so look for Puddles the Clown on the forum later. Oh, yes. All right, along with some Scarborough Fair, huh? Yep. Yep. That was a nice version that you put up, by the way. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I like that one. Glad you liked it. And I will post that in, uh, in the forum as well with a link to where I found it so that people can... Uh, catch it later if they don't have the chat in front of them. Yep. Oh gosh. Kyle is sleepy. Kyle is sleepy. Yep. All right, folks, let's wrap it up for the night. Thank you all for coming. I am going to cut off the uh, do we have any announcements to make? Do we have any announcements? Uh, yep, soon we will have the Enneagram thing, the new Enneagram thing uh, finaled up. We have announced the uh, this month's raffle, which is a book on uh, the Sufi path of annihilation, mm -hmm. written by um, a student of uh, a very interesting teacher who is, uh, related to our tradition, which mm -hmm. I really like. And we have uh, this month's secret talk is on the Enneagram of the Lover. It's stuff that we wouldn't put out in public because it would get us arrested for oh, being yeah, immoral and, and unusual and <laughs> indecent. Indecent, yes. <laughs> Talking about that kind of stuff. And there is a um, a special thing for everybody because it's Christmas because and we like to give away stuff for Christmas. For those of you who have donated this month, you will get access to my secret library where I curate all the best books. That I can so these are ebooks, correct? Yeah, these are ebooks. Yes. Yeah. If you ever come to my house, I'll let you go through my, my actual book library too. But in the meantime, you, there are ebooks, you can download them. Uh, and some of them are really quite good. Yes. And all of this is part of our, you know, our alms donation thing. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, any donation, large or small, automatically enters you in our raffle. And yep. it also means that you get access to the monthly secret talk and to this library of ebooks as well. Yay, December. Yes. Yes. So thank you very much to everyone who's donated. As always, it's it's a huge help to us. So thank yep. you. That, that, your donations allow us to do the stuff that we're doing without trying to figure out how to charge you money for it. So mm -hmm. we love that. Yeah. We love not charging people money. Yep. So I am going to stop the recording and say good night to all from beautiful, sunny New Mexico, <laughs> in the virtual world anyway. Yes. <laughs>